Can you think of a situation that is totally hopeless? Have you ever been in that position? When you watch the news at night and hear of the problems in the world, it's easy to become overwhelmed thinking of all that's going wrong. It can feel like the world is spinning out of control. You might ask yourself, God, where are you in all of this? I can remember a time when I was in a a helpless, hopeless position. I was leading a junior high youth group one one night, and I was in college, and uh, several of our kids had told their other friends who were in gangs about our group. Now, they didn't dare venture into the church that night, but after our youth group was done, they were outside waiting for our junior high students. They were goofing around, and our students, whom we were responsible for, would not get on the bus or in the vans to go home. And these gang members were totally disrespectful uh, to us, they were out of control. You know, they were jumping on you know, the, the vehicles. They were, there were some other places in the church that were dangerous that they were running around on. We had no control over what was happening. And I looked at a couple of the other leaders, and we just prayed, and we called the police. <laughs> when in doubt with your youth group, you call the police, I guess. Our work with that group actually almost always felt hopeless. It seemed like an uphill battle. The students were very needy. They came from broken homes. Their grades were doing poorly. Uh, We loved them. They were a lot of fun to be with, but they were also very deceptive and uncontrollable. And it was what I would call an impossible situation. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about impossible situations and how we can get through them. So I invite you to turn to Mark 9 this morning. We're going to look at Mark 9. And uh, I invite you to stand. We'll read through the whole story here so you get the big picture. It says this, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus... They were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with them? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at night, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can... Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer. This is God's word. You may be seated. The first scene, there's four scenes here that I want to focus in on. Four scenes to this story. The first scene begins at the foot of a mountain. Jesus and the three, Peter, James, and John, they emerge from behind some trees as they're heading back into town. Jesus and the three could not have been more alive. Jesus had taken the three on one of his special trips. He had taken taken them to the top of a mountain, 
perhaps Mount Hermon, and it was the experience of a lifetime. While they were there, they, the three saw the unthinkable. They saw Jesus transfigured. He was glowing. He looked like he was wearing white, and it was just glowing. And they saw the, the two major prophets of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, up here. They watched, and they were amazed. Then they heard the voice of God shout from a cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. They were at the pinnacle of experiences, and they couldn't tell anybody about it. So they head back into town, and they see a crowd, and they hear some noise. While Jesus and the three were up on the mountain, the rest of the disciples were in town. And, and when the cat's away, well, the disciples, they, they try and keep carrying on Jesus' work. Let's read again, verses 14 through 19. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed. And they ran up to him and greeted him. They, he asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Someone from the crowd answers, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. He answered, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. The disciples, being disciples, were trying to do what disciples did. They had watched Jesus heal people and drive out demons. They had, Jesus had commissioned them to go out and do the exact same thing. And disciples learn from their leader, and they imitate their leader. Here they were in the northern part of Israel. It was a new part of the country for them. And they were trying to expand the kingdom territory by doing miracles. Only it didn't go so well. A father and his boy came to the disciples, the son, a mute since birth. And they were asked to drive out the demon. The disciples said, you know, what they had always said. He rebuked the demon. Maybe they even said in the name of Jesus. And nothing happened. They may have repeated themselves a few times. Nothing happened. As the crowd had gathered, things became more and more embarrassing for the disciples. Some scribes showed up, the teachers of the law, the ones who knew all of the right answers. They had all the right answers, of course, but they couldn't do anything about this boy. Maybe they were there to make fun of the disciples. Maybe they said, well, maybe this Jesus you believe in isn't really the true God. Maybe you should try believing in the true God. We, we don't know what the teachers of the law were arguing with the disciples. The disciples, you can, you can imagine that they were trying to defend themselves. Well, we, we did this before. Jesus commissioned us. It worked. You just don't understand. Blah, blah, blah. And then enter Jesus and the three. And the plot thickens. What, what's Jesus going to do? The crowd runs to greet Jesus. Greet him like a rock star. You can just imagine the smartphones coming out. They're all taking pictures of Jesus, trying to get a selfie with him. And Jesus, like a man on a mission, virtually ignores the crowd. He goes right up to the disciples, and he asks them, What are you arguing about? The cat has returned. Or maybe it's more like Papa Bear has returned. He's there to rescue his cubs. The argument with the teachers of the law is over. The father of the boy speaks up and explains the situation. And then Jesus says, he answered everybody. The scribes, the disciples, the crowd, everyone. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? And Jesus knows what's going on here. He says it in his first line. Oh, faithless generation. Sure, there was a stubborn spirit in the boy, but that wasn't the main problem. Faithless hearts was the problem. Hearts that did not believe. Here, too, the people lacked faith. In other places, it says that Jesus couldn't heal people when, the, when the people had no faith. This is the same here. The scribes had knowledge, but they had no faith. The disciples, they had a misplaced faith. What did they put their faith in? They had their faith in a method. 
And they had it in their abilities. They didn't have it in God. Jesus, frustrated by all of this, feels like maybe he's running out of time. He says, bring the boy to me. Well, what does this all mean to us? Well, the starting point for faith is really to, to bring your situation to Jesus. You may have some questions about who Jesus is. You might wonder if the Bible is completely true. You may think that Christians are losers. Whatever your disagreements may be, Jesus is calling you to bring your situation to himself. He wants, you, he wants to deal with you personally. He might use his people along the way, and he will, but he's calling you to himself. I won't deny that there are good questions to ask about Jesus and the Bible. But Jesus wants to settle those questions with you by showing you more of himself and what he can do. Bring your faithless heart to him and pay attention. Let's see what happens in scene two. In this scene, the, the crowd is, kind of fades to the background and we get a close-up of the boy and his father. His boy, the one whom everybody had been talking about and whom the disciples had failed to fix. We read in 20 through 24, They brought him the boy, and when the spirit saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy. He fell to the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And asked, Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and, and into water to destroy him. But if you could do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Like other times, Jesus has come near to a demon-possessed person, the spirit in the boy gives him an episode. You know, it's like the spirit knows that something's going, going to happen to him. So like a wild animal, he doesn't want to be tamed, and the spirit throws him into this episode. He convulses, he rolls, he foams at the mouth. You know, we live in a scientific age that doesn't really give credence much to the existence of demons. You know, we would... Some people would want to explain this away as epilepsy. And, uh, well, certainly those are, you know, those are the, uh, the symptoms of that. The reality of demon possession is real. It's, and uh, there are even there are psychologists, psychiatrists who will give credence to what appears to be demonic activity. You know, when I was in Haiti, uh, I visited there and, and we saw uh, people in doing their voodoo dances and they were totally possessed by something. Now, I, I couldn't verify that that was a demon they were possessed with. Uh, with the, one woman had it, her eyes rolled back into her head. She danced around. Um, but the reality is that people are still possessed by demons. Jesus takes time to hear the Father out. It's been happening his entire life, since he was a child. You could you just imagine this father with his boy he was no longer a child. It says he wasn't in childhood anymore. That means he's in his teens, or maybe he's even older. It wasn't easy to go anywhere with him. He might go into an episode in public, and there people would see, and the father would feel the shame. There would be times when the demons, the demon had tried to kill the boy. This is a twist on suicide, motivated by a demon. The father and friends always kept an eye out for the boy, fearing for his life, torn by his torment. It's not been an easy road. Maybe you know that road. The demons, real or figurative, torment someone you love. No one knows what to do. Everyone copes. Well, the disciples didn't know what to do either. The father is out of ideas and almost out of hope. He's at the end of his resources and like a phrase that almost doesn't come out of his mouth, that almost drops silently like a leaf, he makes his plea like a parent pleading for his child. He'll ask again, despite all the years of suffering, he'll ask, and he starts with a but. But, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He's looking for the slightest bit of compassion. Jesus looks at the Father. If you can. If you can. If you can. All things are possible for one who believes. 
The father, desperate, passionate, tears running down his face, throws aside how he looks and what others think about him. I believe! Help my unbelief! How many times have you been at that point where things seem hopeless and there's no way out? The thought comes, maybe, maybe God can do something about this. Maybe. It's almost an afterthought. Maybe Jesus can help my marriage. Maybe. Maybe he can do something about my irritating neighbor. Maybe. Maybe he can do something with my life, even though I've messed it up. Maybe. Maybe he can provide me for me, even though I lost my job. Maybe. We need to hear again that maybe, maybe, isn't based on God's ability. Of course he can do it. All things are possible with God. God's ability to do what he wants is never in question. What is in question is our ability to believe that God is doing something and will do something. Jesus said, all things are possible for one who believes. We, we tend to limit what God can do. We don't know what God will do. We don't know what he will do. But we know God can do all things. It takes faith to believe that all things are possible. It takes faith to see the possibilities that God has for us. You know, when Erica and I got married, we asked for a certain verse to be part of our wedding ceremony. It's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And we love that verse. We, and we believe that God is capable of doing more than we ask or imagine. And honestly, sometimes we believe that, but we don't see that part about where he's doing far more than we ask or imagine. We've got some faith in God, but we, we, we're not seeing it. We don't know what God has in mind. We don't know because his mind is beyond ours. On our worst days, we're begging for God to do something more abundantly. On our best days, we're rejoicing that God is doing great things. I believe. Help my unbelief. What this passage teaches us, this scene teaches us, it's okay to come to Jesus with a mix of faith and uncertainty. Jesus doesn't require us to have a perfect faith to come to him. Even in the middle of our messed up and desperate lives, he's waiting to hear you cry out, I believe, help my unbelief. The story doesn't end there. There's there's a third scene. This time the spotlight focuses in on the boy. The crowd had wandered off by this time. It says, when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him, never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. All this boy had ever experienced was like a silent movie. The only thoughts in his mind had been unexpressed words. He probably said things, made noises but he didn't know how words were spoken. His body would move in ways that he couldn't control. He'd be at the center of people's attention again, but he he didn't know what was going on. In this particularly violent episode, he lay on the ground, stiff as a board, eyes open. But this time, he heard. He couldn't understand it, but he heard. He heard the crowd saying, he is dead, is what they were saying. Well, the crowd, you know, they didn't have the faith to stick around to see what Jesus would do. But this boy, he heard. He felt someone grab his hand. He felt his body relax. And he felt strength in his right and his left. He stood up. He looked in the eyes of that man who had said these words over him. He saw Jesus. Jesus had done it. He had said the words like this to hundreds of other people and healed them. 
He gave this boy that same new life. What a picture of what has happened to so many of us. When Jesus gave us a new life, we were helpless, deaf, mute, some given to destructive behaviors. But we had people pleading with us, pleading with God, maybe a friend or a parent, somebody who brought us to Jesus. We didn't understand what the crowd was saying. We didn't understand everything about Jesus. But Jesus spoke those words to us and brought us new life. Maybe that's you today. Jesus is here to bring you new life. In fact, the reason he came to earth was to bring all of us back to life. We'd wandered far from God. We had done evil. We had made choices that were rebellious against him. We were, in fact, spiritually dead. We couldn't initiate or respond to conversation. And by the gift of God, Jesus suffered on the cross to pay the price for our rebellion. And then he rose again after three days. So when we believed in him, we got a new life. And that belief, even that belief, because remember we were dead. The belief was a gift from God. Jesus wants to bring you back to life. Maybe you don't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. But you feel this hand lifting you. Prepare yourself to believe in the man who brings you life. Cling to him. Know that since he's given you a new life, He is worthy of your faith. You can believe in this man. There's a fourth scene. And really this scene is for those of us who have been believers and especially ministers, servants in the church for a long time. It's a word to disciples. It says this, when when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Prayer. As the disciples, as the disciples, we are in the school of hard knocks of following Jesus. And like these disciples, we also ask that question, why couldn't we? Lord, why didn't this work? What do we do with failure in ministry? Well, two things come to mind in this passage. First, there's an emphasis that the disciples had become confident in themselves. They would command the demons to leave, like Jesus did, but really they weren't Jesus. We're not Jesus. We don't have the authority that he has. They were only able to to do miracles by Jesus' authority and Jesus' power. They had become confident in themselves. The second thing flows out of that, that things could have been different for these disciples if they had prayed. From this account, they didn't pray. They needed to rely on God more through prayer, trusting in Him, if they wanted to see the kingdom of God advance. The disciples, even though they've been doing ministry probably for a few months, had fallen into the trap of being faithless too. They needed to renew their faith, and the way to do it was through prayer. Emmanuel Church, you've been going for 59 years. Let me just say that the answer to the question, why why can't we, is answered by Jesus. It's only by prayer. You know, as we start the kids' clubs and Sunday schools and Bible studies and things, this new ministry season, and as we look at the real possibility of eliminating the evening service and and starting other disciple-making ministries, let me challenge you to intentionally pray for the empowering of the Holy Spirit to ask Jesus to help in your ministry. We're going to gather in two weeks from tonight in a concert of prayer. We're going to pray together. But let me challenge you as well in your individual lives, in your small groups. Pray before you start doing ministry. It makes a huge difference. You're not relying on yourself anymore. You're relying on God's power. For everything you do, do it in prayer. Because we're really, we're trying to do the impossible here. We're not necessarily trying to cast out demons. But we're trying to change hearts, change minds, trying to make disciples. How's that going to happen? By the authority and power of Jesus and trusting in him. We need to come on our knees before him and pray. In closing, the journey from faithless to faithful is, is a hard one. Where do you find yourself in this story? Are you like the person in the crowd 
You've got some interest in Jesus. You're intrigued by him. You're not that interested to spend much more energy on him. Well, someday, I hope you will. I hope you become more than just a fan. I hope you'll do all you can to be part of this movement of the kingdom. Take a small step today. Say, I believe, Jesus, you have good things for me. I want to know you better. Join with a group of other disciples in a study. Don't stay in the crowd. Maybe you're like the Father. Maybe you're hopeless because you're not even sure God can do anything in your life anymore. You need to fight the fight of faith. Even as you're here this morning, ask for help to believe more. Go directly to Jesus, knowing with him all things are possible. Are you like the Son? Are you dead to the world? Unable to comprehend a word? Let Jesus lift you. Jesus wants to bring you new life. Are you a discouraged disciple? Buckle down in your prayer life. You know where the power comes from. I want to give you a moment to just respond in prayer before Jesus. What would you say to him right now? I'm just going to give you 30 seconds. What would you say to him right now? Jesus, give us the grace to see you as the God of the possible. Open our eyes to your power, even as we grasp how little we have. Would you fill our hearts with your promises? Fill our hearts with your spirit. Ignite our faith, O God. We believe. Help us in our unbelief.